Hey, good morning, everyone. You know what? Just look at the person next to you and say, man, you look great today. Ready? One, two, three, go. Uh, don't you feel better already? Yeah, all right. How many of you are married and that's the first time you heard that this morning? Yeah, shame on you, boys. Shame on you, husbands. All right. Well, it's good to have you with us. If you are a guest with us this morning, we especially welcome you here today and are glad you came. Whatever brought you here, maybe you're traveling, came to see family, just here kicking the tires, whatever, we're just glad that you're here. If you haven't yet, if you look at the card in front of you, on the seat back in front of you, if you take your uh, camera app on your phone, and you may have to go no Wi-Fi because our Wi-Fi has been acting up a little bit, Um, and if you uh, point that at it or your QR reader... Uh, the top one will bring up a virtual bulletin for you, have the announcements, the scripture will be in, the outline for today, and then the bottom QR code will take you to a connection card, and the connection card allows us to know uh, what's going on in your life, if you need us to pray for you, or if you need information from us, you can fill out the connection card by scanning that bottom one, all right? Um, I want to introduce, uh, in the event that you weren't here last time he was here, this is Drew Crick. Let's give Drew a warm KCC welcome. Uh, Daryl thought he was going to be gone doing a gig this weekend, so we reached out to Drew, and then Daryl was able to be here, but then we didn't have a soundboard guy, so Daryl's on the soundboard, Drew's here to lead us in worship, but anyway, it's all working out for the glory of Jesus, so that's all that matters, right? Uh, So we're glad that you're here today. Why don't you stand with me, let me pray, and then Drew's going to lead us in song. Father God, thank you so much for this day. We just praise your name uh, every Sunday, Lord God. It's just a special time that we get to be together with our brothers and sisters in Christ and just worship you and glorify you. And that as we find our Fabas once again, as we are in awe of you, as we find our fear in you again, this deep respect and honor that we have for you, I pray that that's reflected in our worship this morning and how we sing to you and praise your name, Father. Thank you for Drew. I'm glad that he's be able to be here with us to lead us in worship and song today. And I pray, uh, Lord God, that you would work powerfully through him. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. All God's people said... All right, let's sing. Morning, church. How are we doing? Good, good. You know, I woke up this morning and uh, I was excited because I, I, you know, I have a pair of chacos. You guys know what chacos are? Yeah. I like to call them my Jesus sandals because they kind of look like that. And um, I was washing windows last night or yesterday, and um, I just realized I totally forgot them at the other customer's house. And I was like, oh crap! I don't get to wear my Jesus sandals today. So sad day, but that's okay. Um, but yeah, uh, we're going to start off with uh, Lion and the Lamb. Uh, you know, I believe that there are two types of worshipers. You've got your, your, uh, you know, your singers, your good singers, and your worshipers. Um, and you've also got your Joyful Noise people, which are just the people that they don't give a rip about how they sound. So where are my Joyful Noise people at? Where are they at? Come on, hands up. Don't be ashamed. There we go. I'd love to hear it. All right, we'll start with Lion and the Lamb. He's coming on the clouds Kings and kingdoms will bow down And every chain will break As broken hearts declare His praise Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God, our God is the Lion The Lion of Judah He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. And our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain, the scene of the world. His blood breaks the chain. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before Him. So open up the gates, make way before the King of Kings. That God who comes to save. He's here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? 
Our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chain. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord? Our God is a lion, the lion of Judah. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Every knee will bow before Him. Our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. His blood breaks the chain. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before the Lion and the Lamb. Every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb. The lion and the lamb. Amen. All right, this next song is by a friend of mine. Uh, his name's Aaron Boyd. Uh, how many of you know him? Blue Tree, he wrote the song, God of the City. Crazy Irishman. Yeah, great guy. Uh, it's called Amazing Grace, um, but it's to the tune of Oh Danny Boy. And uh, it goes a little something like this. How sweet the sound that saves the wretch that saved a wretch like me. And I once was lost, was lost, but now I'm found. And I once was blind, so blind, but now I see. Y'all got that? Let's do that again. Amazing grace. How sweet, how sweet the sound That saved a wretch That saved a wretch like me And I once was lost Was lost but now I'm found And I once was blind So blind but now I And I will trust and I will trust in you alone, my Savior For you have won my heart and I am yours And I will live each day within this victory Amazing grace, so oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound Amazing grace Amazing grace, how sweet, how sweet the sound Saved a wretch, that saved a wretch like me 
And I once was lost, was lost, but now I'm found. And I once was blind, so blind, but now I see. And I will trust, and I will trust in you alone, my Savior. For you have won my heart, and I am yours. And I will live each day within this victory. Oh, amazing grace, oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And I will trust in you alone, my Savior. For you have won my heart and I am yours. And I will live each day within this victory. Oh, amazing grace, oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Oh, amazing grace, oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Oh, praise the name of the Lord. God, oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing Your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God. I cast my mind, I cast my mind to Calvary. Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet. My Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound, his body bound and drenched in tears. They laid him down in Joseph's tomb. The entrance sealed by every stone. Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord of God. Oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing Your praise, O oh Lord, O oh Lord our God. On the third, at break of dawn, Son of heaven rose again. Oh, trample dead, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Yeah. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His He shall return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints. My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Amen. Let's repeat that again. I'll return in robes of white. The blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints. My gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Oh, 
praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing Your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God. Oh, praise the name. Praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing Your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God. Oh Lord. Thank you for leading worship. Great. Praise the Lord, right? Yeah. Well, I appreciate Andy's uh, message last week and going on with prayer. And uh, it um, motivated me to, I don't know if it did you, but to kind of do an inventory of prayer. Um, and what kind of prayers you offer up to God, how often, or maybe not as often. Uh, but it was interesting I found myself not praying enough, I think, uh, through the week. Uh, this morning I'd like to share with you on John, Gospel of John, the chapter 17. And the whole chapter is a prayer that Jesus offers up, that whole chapter. And I just want to share a segment of that, because I don't know if Andy has that in his next messages or next afters. But the whole chapter, John 17, uh, you take some time to read the, the whole chapter. John uh, has Jesus praying for himself to start with. He's asking God to glorify him, that he is the one that is bringing eternal life to us, to assure and be that. And he is, of course, we know. And then he prays for the disciples, that he knows that he's trained up or learned in, in the gospel and his ways to follow him, and he's praying for them to keep the evil away from them, protect them, and then the scripture I want to read to you this morning is a prayer for believers, for us. He was praying into the future, and uh, so I'd like to start uh, John 17, uh, verse 20. This is, my prayer is not for them alone, the disciples. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message. I think I'm ringing or something here. Do I need to change this? I don't know. Sound guy doesn't. Okay. All right, so I'll start over. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that the, they may be one as we are one. It's pretty powerful. He's asking God, because they are one, he wants us to be that oneness. That's amazing. I in them and you and me, may be, they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved me even as you have loved me. Father, I want those who have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them. This prayer was 
after he instituted the Lord's Supper and prior to his arrest when they were coming uh, to uh, arrest him. So he had us on our, his mind through that whole time, through the stress of what was to become. Yet he wanted to be confident that he was the one and for sure the eternal life through him for us. What a prayer that he offered up for us. So as we come before this table or before the time of remembrance, um, I need my... Before we take uh, uh, emblems, I'd like to pray, please. Father God, how amazing God you are, that you made your son to come down to heaven to be that sacrifice, that perfect sacrifice for us. Father God, we know that you love us, and you loved him enough to give his life for us. Thank you, God, for the message that you've sent through the disciples and through those that, you've, that followed you on this earth. And Father, we are grateful that you prayed for us when you were here, asking the Father to be one in unity. Thank you, God, for the unity that we share as a body. Thank you for this time that we can share in that unity by partaking of these emblems of the body and the blood of Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. Take of the bread. Let's partake together. All right, let's, uh, let's pray before we dive in this morning, all right? Father, it's uh, in humility that we approach you this morning and just um, want to pour ourselves out before you and say thank you. Thank you for loving us. Uh, thank you for sending Jesus to die for us. Thank you for your word that we can read and pour over and love and gain instruction. Uh, thank you for being a God that rules graciously yet justly. And Father, now as we open up your word, as we dive into prayer and what it means to be a part of you, uh, Lord, I pray that you would teach us and again just instruct us and train us uh, in what it means to be your children, what it means to love you. Thank you for your mercy again and your grace, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we started this uh, series last Sunday. And uh, am I loud? It sounds like I'm loud. No? Yeah, I'm a little loud. Daryl, I'm a little loud. I don't know why. Probably because I'm yelling. Uh, we started a series last Sunday called Lord, Teach Us to Pray. And our, again, our theme for the year is reset. And we thought it was important to reset our prayer life. And for a year, we had been praying that God would take away the virus from our world. We had been praying that as the world was shut down, that families would disciple inside the home. We were praying for opportunities to serve, and God was uh, giving us those moments and those opportunities, so I, I pray that you were taking advantage of those moments. Um, and now as we're coming out of the pandemic and people are coming back to church, which is awesome to see and so wonderful to have some hugs and handshakes that I haven't had in a while, um, it's an amazing thing, and I thought, you know, we need to reset our prayer life once again to say, what does it look like now that we're on the other side of this to be the church God has called us to be, and in praying and asking God to lead us in that direction and what that means. And so we wanted to talk about how to reset our prayer life. And I decided to use this passage in Luke chapter 11, and in Luke chapter 11, the disciples, um, these Jewish men that they knew how to pray, they had grown up in Jewish boys' school and in Jewish families that we know that they knew what it mean to pray. I mean, they were fishermen. I mean, fishermen know how to pray. Fishermen on the Sea of Galilee especially, because storms could come up. You know that they were praying men, praying for a fish, catch, whatever. The tax collector, you know he was a praying dude. I just want to make sure I make it through the day today, collecting taxes from these people. And so we know they were prayers, yet they saw something in Jesus that they thought, 
we want to learn how he prays. And so they approach Jesus, and again, they ask him or they say to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us to pray like John taught his disciples, speaking of John the Baptist, taught his disciples to pray. And last week we looked at, Jesus started out by saying, pray this way. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. We need to remember who we're talking to. We need to remember who we're approaching, whose throne we're approaching with our requests. Whose throne we're approaching to acknowledge and to ask and to talk to. We need to remember where we are when we pray. And we talked about finding our fabas, finding our fear in God once again, remembering that as we approach his throne, this is the God of the universe. This is the God that created all things. And we need to have a deep honoring respect and fear for who he is. Well, Jesus goes on in um, what we call the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer to make this phrase or to say this phrase. And that as you study some phrases in the Bible, it can be a little bit mind-bending, can it not? I mean, it can kind of be, okay, I read this real quick, or I'm studying this, and it looks like when I do a word study, it can mean several different things, and that's a phrase that we're going to see today. In Luke chapter 11, verse 2, the second half of it, after he says, pray this way, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, he says, your kingdom come. Your kingdom come. Now, when I first read your kingdom come, or when you first hear it, what's your first thought? This is audience participation. It's okay. What's that? God. God's kingdom, okay? That we want his kingdom to come, right? That we want it to come, right? Any other thoughts? Jesus returning. Yeah. I think that's the first thing that comes to mind. When I read it, I think Jesus is telling them, pray for the return of Jesus, the second coming of Jesus. It doesn't quite seem to make sense because he hasn't ascended yet, and that might be a little confusing for them, that's the, but that's the first thing that comes to mind. And I wanted to look at three different angles that we might look at this phrase, your kingdom come, and what that might mean, and what some different experts and people say about God's kingdom. And we'll see it in different places in scripture. We'll talk about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, and what are they, and are they different, are they same? What exactly are those things? And Jesus, all we know is he prayed. He said, when you pray... Acknowledge who God is, and then say, your kingdom come. Well, again, the first thought is we think about three thoughts on your kingdom come. The first one is, as mentioned, and I agree, is that the kingdom of God is the second coming of Jesus. And I had prepared when I was uh, thinking about this Sunday and your kingdom come, I was starting to pull out all the scripture about heaven and what it's going to be like and what it's going to be like to leave this life and what it's going to be like for Jesus to come again and establish all things new on earth. And I was, I was getting pretty excited about it, if you can imagine that. You can't, can you? Are you guys there today? I'm a little tired too, but we're all right. Okay. But as I was looking at those verses of Scripture, I started to get excited. That's when I, I saw kind of the two couple of different views about it. But in this first view of just praying, your kingdom come, Jesus, we want you to come back again to restore all things. I look at Revelation chapter 22, and there's four red letter statements in Revelation 22. And if you have a Bible that has red letter edition, you know that those red letters are what? The words of Jesus, right? Somebody wrote down a quote. We don't have any evidence that Jesus actually wrote things down, but they, they were quoting Jesus. And this is what he says in verses 7, 12, 16, and 20. Verse 7 says, And behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. The next one says, Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay each one for what he has done. That's a little convicting. The next one says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you about these things for the churches. I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. And the last one, it says, he who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The first thing that we know about the second coming of Jesus is what? It's going to happen. It's not a matter of if. It's absolutely a matter of when. And all through scripture, what do we find out about it? Nobody knows but God the Father. Nobody knows when it's going to be. It's going to happen in the twinkle of an eye, so it's going to happen quickly. And that it absolutely will take place. And so if you're praying, your kingdom come, and you're approaching it from a perspective of you're asking 
God to send the Son again to make all things new and for the second coming and judgment day and all of that, what does that mean that you and I need to do for that event? We need to be prepared. <laughs> we need to be prepared. And my, three of my favorite parables um, are in Matthew chapter 25. And I won't tell them all. I've shared them with you before in another message. But in Matthew chapter 25, we have the parable of the virgins. If you remember that story um, and uh, the, the, the moral of uh, the lesson of that parable, if you will, is that we're to be prepared for when the bridegroom comes because we don't want to be kept or left out in the darkness and we go knocking on the door and the bridegroom says, I never knew you. So that first parable, the parable of the ten virgins, is all about being prepared. Are we prepared for when the bridegroom comes? The second parable is the parable of the talents. The master gives one five, one two, one one, goes on a long journey, comes back, and he asks them to account for what he had given them. And the one with five doubled it, the one with two doubled it, and the one with one just buried it in the sand. And he told that one to get out of there and took what he had and gave it to the others. And what do we learn from that one? We learn that you and I, maybe a five-talent person, a two-talent person, a one-talent person, but God has left us responsible to be the person that he created us to be, and what are we going to have to show for it when he comes again? So we need to be prepared, and there is work to be done while we're waiting for him to come back. And then the third one in Matthew chapter 25 is the sheep and the goats. The sheep and the goats on Judgment Day, he separates people, the right and the left, and the whole test about whether you enter into your eternal rest with God the Father or if you're cast into outer darkness is what? Did you feed Jesus? Did you give Jesus a drink? Did you clothe him? Did you go visit him? Did you care for him? And both of them were like, well, when did we do that for you? And Jesus said what? As much as you've done it for who? The least of these, you've done it for me. What do we know about the second coming of Jesus? It's coming and we need to be prepared for it. And preparation looks like always be on the watch. It looks like being the men and women of God he's called us to be and doing the work that he's prepared in advance for us to do. And it means loving those who can't help themselves. It means loving others, right? And so that's one particular angle. Now, here's the issue that I have with that interpretation that Jesus praying or instructing the disciples to pray, your kingdom come, meaning the second coming. Number one, again, he hadn't ascended to be with the Father yet, and it would be a little confusing to them, and he's teaching them how to pray, and that seems a little off for that interpretation. But there's one other reason that it really bothers me that I think, I don't think that that's what Jesus meant, and it's this. How many of you have had a thought in the last month, man, I wish Jesus would come back right now? The rest of your line. I know it, right? When we get in a valley, we're having trouble at home, we're having trouble at work, and there's just those moments. I kind of had one of those moments earlier this week. I was having trouble with the car, and it was just like, Lord, if Jesus came back right now, it would not be the worst thing, right? You've had those moments, haven't you? Yeah, I think you're just still tired and you're not responding to me today, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep working. We're staying here until you guys, all right, that's better, all right? We've all had those moments, and but this is... This is the thing about the second coming of Jesus. It's going to happen, and you and I can do nothing about it. And if I pray that prayer, I think it's about the most selfish prayer that I can pray. Because if I pray for Jesus to come again, and he does, what does that mean? There's a whole bunch of people I know that don't know Jesus, that I've just prayed for him to come back so that they could go spend the time in hell instead of with him. And so that's for that interpretation where I thought, you know, I don't know if that's really what Jesus is angling for here. That is a truth. He's coming back again. We need to be prepared. But for me to pray it, maybe a little bit neglecting those around me that I need to be sharing Jesus with. All right, so let's look at the second translation or interpretation that people have for this kingdom coming. The second one is uh, simply that the kingdom of God is the church. That the kingdom of God is the church. That as Jesus was teaching them to pray, he was saying, um, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, and may your church come quickly. May your church come. May your church, your uh, kingdom be established in the, in the kingdom or on earth, and for the church to rule as the bride of Christ, as a place where people learn about Jesus, grow in their relationship with him, and they just simply say that the kingdom of God is the church. This is the church. This is probably the most interesting verse to me that gives that interpretation a whole bunch of credence. 
In Luke 22, 18, all right? In Luke chapter 22, we're having the establishment of the Lord's Supper. And we just, we just had it here a minute ago, right? And in the Lord's Supper, Jesus is establishing this. And he said, you know, here's, here's the bread, and this is my body given for you. This is my blood poured out for many, and uh, the new covenant, my blood of the new covenant. Um, and so he's establishing that with them. But then he says this phrase in verse 18. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. What if the kingdom of God is the church and that every Sunday we're communing with Jesus when we take the Lord's Supper? And that could only take place if his kingdom has come, meaning the church. And so that's one interpretation I thought was very interesting, that if we say your kingdom come really means we want the church to come and that when Jesus says, I'm not going to have the fruit of the vine until the kingdom or the church comes, now that the church is established, that when we take communion, we're communing with Jesus every Sunday. I think that's kind of an interesting interpretation. Anybody else or is that just me? Yes, it's just you. Okay. Well, there's this guy named Scott McKnight. He's an author. He's a professor. Um, I didn't look up what college he went to. He's a PhD, a really smart guy. But he he wrote a book about the kingdom of God, meaning uh, that it is the church, that that's what that means. And he said, in order for a kingdom to be a kingdom, there have to be five things present. He said, the first one is it has to have a king. Obviously, the church has a king, and his name is Jesus. Secondly, he says that king needs a rule. He needs to have redeemed the people and govern the people. So there needs to be a leadership aspect, and we know that that's who Jesus is to the church. He goes on to say that a kingdom needs people, which, of course, is the church, right? We know that the church is not this building as beautiful and nice as this is. We know that this is not the church. The church is the people. You know, you got the little kid thing where it's church, steeple, open the, you know, the people thing. Yeah, that was for the kids. Fourth, we know that a kingdom has to have a will or a law, that there has to be guidance and structure as to this is what it means to live in this kingdom and be a part of that. You could say for us that we have the two greatest commandments, love God and love others. And he says, fifth, that a kingdom needs land or a sacred space. And that, again, being the church and the people that are within the church. So I thought that that interpretation was interesting. That Jesus, um, when the disciples say, teach us to pray, and he says, all right, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, meaning your church to be established here on earth, so that what? So that Jesus will commune with the people when they come together to worship, and that also that this king is ruling here on earth by way of his church, and that the church is the conduit for the message of the gospel and discipleship and all these things to take place. And I think that's a really interesting aspect or interpretation of the kingdom of God. But then there's this one that I really think is what he's talking about. The kingdom of God is in us. That when we pray, your kingdom come, we're asking for Jesus to be the Lord of our life. And this little kingdom that is me. That when I pray, I'm not only acknowledging who God is and finding my phobos and having my fear in who God is and being in awe of who he is, but I'm asking him also to be that in here, to be the king, the Lord of my life and of who I am. Let me share these verses of scripture with you. This is what happens when you and I surrender our lives to Jesus, okay? Romans 6, 5. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, and he's talking about baptism, right? Immersion, all the way under, right? For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. There's this unity that takes place between us and Jesus when we surrender our lives to him and are baptized in a watery grave. We unite with Jesus in his death and his burial and his resurrection. In John 14, 23, Jesus answered him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. When we accept Jesus as Savior, he's dwelling inside of us. 1 John 4, 15, Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. And how is this taking place, of course? Through the Holy Spirit that Jesus said, I'm going to ask the, helper, ask the Father to send the Helper. And so God, by way of the Holy Spirit, Jesus, by way of the Holy Spirit, dwelling inside of us. Galatians 2.20a, I love this verse. I have been crucified with Christ. 
It is no longer I who live, but it's Christ who what? Who lives in me. Colossians 1.27, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. I believe that Jesus is telling the disciples to pray that God would come be the Lord of their life and would rule their kingdom the kingdom of their heart. So we say, okay, Andy, um, I've become a Christian and I want that to take place and I've prayed that, or if I pray that, how do I know if it's taken place? Like, what's the test for that? 2 Corinthians 13, 5 says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? Well, what's the test? What does it look like to examine myself to see if I truly do have God's kingdom dwelling inside of me? Well, I think the easiest answer is probably in Galatians 5, through 24. Many of you know this one. You probably went over in VBS or church camp a hundred times and probably teaching it to your kids. But the fruit of the Spirit, you know this one? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such, such things... There is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have what? Have crucified the flesh with passions and desires. Remember what it said in uh, Galatians? I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. We have the same thing that happens um, to our passions and desires, that when we surrender to Jesus, we crucify those things. And so on self-examination, when it comes to understanding, is the kingdom of God living inside of me? We need only to look and say, you know what, when I pass by people, when I live my life, when I'm in my home and at work and with my family, are they seeing, are they experiencing love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control? Were they experiencing some other kind of evil? We need to examine ourselves. And then it comes down to, or the next aspect of it is, that there's work to be done. There's a work that can be done to make sure that when we examine ourselves the next time, we're becoming more and more like Jesus. In our work, Matthew 6, says, seek first the kingdom of God. So it's not just asking for it, it's also seeking it. How can I seek after being someone that God is living inside of and ruling my life so that others see me and say, wow, there's something different about that guy. He seems to have surrendered to something else other than himself. We seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. In Colossians 3, and this is a pretty lengthy passage, so bear with me. If, you, <clears throat> if then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek or Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you almost must also must forgive. And above all these, put on what? Love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. 
And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If I'm going to pray for God's kingdom to take over my heart, I need to examine myself to see if I've allowed that to take place. If I really am living according to the Spirit living inside of me. 1 Corinthians 3, Paul says this, But I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Paulus, are you not being merely human? Paul said, you're supposed to be spiritual people because you've accepted Jesus as Savior. And they need to pray for God's kingdom to come. Why? Because he couldn't even talk to them as spiritual people because all he could do is just give them milk and milk, and they were never moving to solid food. Why? Because they were still pursuing the things of this life and of the flesh. And Paul, in that longer Colossians passage I read, he said, there's things you need to put to death, and there's things that you need to live for. And as we live for those things that reflect Jesus and his love for us and his love for the world, that's when God's kingdom has truly come and rules our life. Praying for the kingdom of God to come is asking God to be your king and for you to be his loyal subject. And it's asking him to be your Lord. This is what I think is uh, most interesting about what Jesus said. He said, pray our Father which art in heaven, right? He said, acknowledge who God is. Remember who he is. Remember who you're talking to. Your kingdom come, meaning I want your kingdom to take over my life. Why would that be so important? Well, the first thing we think about, is it not when we pray, is are the things that we need to pray for. Heal this person. Fix this problem. Take care of this issue. I need one of these. I want one of those. And what does it say in James chapter 5? The prayers of the who? Righteous are powerful and effective. If we jump right from even I acknowledge who God is to my laundry list of things without having Jesus Lord of our life, are we a righteous person standing before God? And can we expect to receive anything from God? So I believe that what Jesus was telling his disciples was acknowledge who you're in front of, acknowledging who you're praying to, acknowledging who you are bowing before, and then ask him to be Lord of your life because you're next going to get to all these requests that you have, and all these requests that you have may fall on deaf ears because you've not even accepted him as Lord of your life, yet you're going to him as Lord, asking him to take care of all this stuff. (laughs) Last week we talked about finding your fabas. Finding the fear in the one who created all things. And after we find our Fabas, it's time to ask him to be our father. It's time to ask him to be our father. Because when we ask our father for things, just like it says in scripture, he knows what you need and he'll give you those things. But if you ask a stranger for those same requests, they're going to look at you like, why should I give you bread? I have to go feed my own family bread. (laughs) When we approach the throne of God to pray. Fear him for who he is. But allow him and ask him to be your father. And if your prayer has to stop right there, you'll have done great work. And what it means for him to be your father is to put away all the things of this life and all the things of this earth and to simply keep your eyes on him. He's living inside of you. He wants to be your king. We have to relinquish the lordship and say, I'm yours. I'm say, I'm yours. Teach us to pray, Jesus. Acknowledge who God is and ask him to be Lord of your life. And then we'll get to the part that you think is the most important. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for giving us the, the blessing of prayer, that you would allow that to happen between us and you, that you would allow us the opportunity to communicate with you. We thank you that you've given us that avenue that we can approach your throne. And Lord, I'm asking, I'm praying that you would help us to 
Just acknowledge who you are daily when we pray and remember who you are as the creator of the universe. Your name is great. Your power is great. And we surrender to that. And Father, also, we want to pray that your kingdom would come in our life, that we would submit to you and surrender our whole life to you, that if there's anything that we're holding on to, that we would be ready to just let that go and let you take over and let you take control, Father God. We thank you for the model prayer. We thank you for this prayer that Jesus taught the disciples. May we learn what it means to not only fear you, but to make you our Father. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. stand in worship. Are you hurting? Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling Have you come to the end of yourself? Or do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness. Was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind, leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Oh, come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was born with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he down before him for he is Lord of all sing hallelujah Christ is risen oh, what a savior savior isn't he Bow down, bow down before Him, for He is Lord of 
Time, I'll come to the altar. All right, oh, <laughs> do that bridge again. Oh, what a savior! Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah! Christ is risen. Bow down. Bow down before Him, for He is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, come to the altar. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Oh come, oh come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, just our voice. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Bear your cross as you Crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found uh, Real quick, let me run through uh, some announcements for you uh, First of all, we're starting a new uh, Bible study tonight called Adult-ish um, so it's uh, for any uh, folks that have graduated high school uh, through about, I don't know, 21, 22 years old and are just kind of on that journey to, uh, you know, living the adult life. Uh, so uh, it's going to be at my house, 1645 Dean Drive, tonight at 7 o'clock. And um, uh, Scott and Kaylin are going to help me lead that. They're going to study the book of James, but also just open it up for some tough questions uh, that maybe uh, folks that age are looking at. So if you know anyone that age group, um, and if you're even stretching the boundaries but you'd like to come, let me know. We'll probably, we'll probably give you a pass, but you might have an initiation phase. We'll let you know. Uh, but anyway, so Adultish starts tonight, 7 o'clock, our house uh, at the Bratton Home. If you need more details, you can let me know. Uh, after church. Uh, secondly is Vacation Bible School. Um, we need you to pre-register this year uh, because uh, we've got some uh, limitations. So um, we need you to pre-register. We'll probably have room for everybody, but we need you to register first. Um, walk-ins are just not going to be a good thing that day. All right. So we need you to pre-register at uh, kccwired.com and uh, to uh, let you know how much fun they're going to have, uh, we got a little video for you. So watch the screen. Are you ready for the most epic adventure ever? Group VBS is taking kids on a ride they'll never forget. Get on board the Rocky Railway. Your church will be on track 
at Sing and Play Express. With Jesus to lead us, we're on the right Get ready for high energy fun at Locomotion Games. Experience impactful Bible lessons and Bible adventures. You'll have amazing discoveries at Imagination Station. Take a glimpse into the world of five awesome kids who learn that Jesus' power pulls us through. The best part of summer is full steam ahead at Rocky Railway. All right, that's coming up. How many of you adults were like, I like trains, can I come? Yes, you can help. We'll let you. Yeah, so that's starting up, I think it says uh, June 28th, I believe. Yeah, June 28th to July 1st, 9 to noon. Um, so uh, make sure you register kids, grandkids, niece, nephews, neighbor down the street, right? Uh, KCCWired.com. Um, the other thing, uh, coming up Sunday on the 27th of June is our next Discover KCC. And I haven't had uh, one of these in a while because of COVID and stuff. We tried to do a Zoom one, and it was okay. Um, but uh, Discover KCC is a class that we uh, offer to let you know or to help explain to you what we believe as a church uh, from a theological standpoint, also how we're set up as a church as far as leadership and that kind of thing, uh, but also what's expected of you if you say, I want to be a member of Kalkaska Church of Christ. Um, so I would encourage you, if you haven't uh, been through that class or you've just kind of been uh, coming in, visiting, not sure if you want to become a part of us yet, if you want uh, questions about baptism, Baptism always come up. Um, we can explain those and talk through that as well. Um, but if you could sign up at kccwired.com, um, that'll be on the 27th. It's from 5 to 8 p.m., and uh, we'll serve you dinner. Um, um, I don't have child care plans, so if, uh, if that's a problem, let me know. But if you could find child care, that'd be great. Um, so we could just kind of have some adult time during that time. That would be good. But that's a Discover KCC coming up on the 27th. Uh, speaking of which, next Sunday's Father's Day, right? I almost forgot Father's Day. Been so busy. Father's Day's coming up. This is your warning, kids. Make sure you go out and pamper your, pamper your dad. They love burnt scrambled eggs. That's their favorite. All right. Uh, and then uh, the last one I have is our uh, 214 project. Um, so uh, our roofing project has changed a little bit in that um, I sent some, a recon team. Um, Jeff Badgero flew over uh, the roof, and then he went, stopped by, and checked it out. And he said, we really do need to strip the old uh, shingles off. And so um, this, is what I'm, um, this is what the plan is. And, and I really need to know who's going to be in and help um, because I'm not going to drive over there by myself, all right? <laughs> so Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 5 p.m., we're going to meet in the church parking lot, drive to Manistee, and just spend a couple hours peeling off shingles, okay? And then Saturday, the hope is that we'll be ready to start shingling the roof. And um, so last week, I mentioned a time that we were going to leave, and Jeff reminded me that it starts to get hot pretty quick now, and that there's another 6 o'clock. So we're actually going to leave from the church parking lot at 6 a.m. on Saturday um, to go to Manistee so we can try to work in the coolness of the day as much as we can, okay? So if you are willing to go and help, and I need people more nimble than I am to get up on the roof, okay? Um, so if, you're, if that's you and you can do that, I need you to let me know so I know how to plan. And they're planning food for us over there and everything. So please let me know uh, either at andy at kccwired.com or come up and tell me afterwards. I'll jot your name in my, in my tablet. Um, but we, I just need to know who, who's in for that project. We just really want to bless them and try to save them um, some money and, and to help out. And so um, if you're able and willing to do that, that'd be great. Um, is Erica Cole am I here this morning? How about Brad Smith? You here this morning? All right. Um, and I think, uh, I think most of the folks are second shift. Or second shift. Listen to me. Second service. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of funny, isn't it? Uh, anyway, so we've had, we've had a lot of folks to get baptized. We had a um, lady baptized, uh, Samantha was baptized last Sunday after second service. Um, and so we've just had the waters of baptism are moving. Um, so if uh, God's laying it on your heart and your spirit to be like, you know, what's this baptism thing about? Um, come and talk to me so that we can just uh, uh, make sure, you know, where you're at with that, where you're at in Scripture with that. I'm not going to pressure you or anything. I just want to lay out for you what the Bible says about that. Um, I'd love to have that conversation with you. And then uh, also, I just, I'd be remiss if I didn't put this invitation out there. We've talked about making God Lord of our life, and if you've not taken the first step of surrendering to him and what it means to have faith and believe and repent and confess and be baptized, uh, I'd love to talk with you about that, and I'll be up here after the service, uh, after Drew leaves us in one more chorus. Okay? I think that that's all that I have. I feel like I'm forgetting one, Mark. Is, am I forgetting one? Huh? Oh. 
Oh, thank you. <laughs> the treasurer likes me to bring this one up. Uh, so uh, we don't, we're not passing offering uh, right now, and I, I'm, kind of, I'm kind of liking the boxes. We may keep it this way. But anyway, um, if you've come prepared to give and worship in that way, uh, we have offering boxes in the back. You can text to give to 84321. Um, you can send your tithes and offerings to P.O. Box 757, Kalkaska, Michigan, 49646, or you can give online at kccwired.com. Uh, and again, my only request is however you do it, just do it in a worshipful way, all right? Just make sure you stop and pray over your offering. Ask God to bless it um, uh, before you put it in there. Okay? Why don't you stand with me? Let's pray. And uh, Drew's going to lead us in one more course, and we'll see you next week. Father, thank you so much for this morning. And, Lord, we do approach you as King of kings and Lord of lords. And your name is great, Father God. And uh, we love you. And we do fear you. We're in awe of who you are. And, Father, our prayer, my request is that you would come into the lives and hearts of our people, that you would be Lord of our lives and that we would open up the kingdom wide for you and trust you and follow you and surrender to you and to you alone. Others, we go from this place with all these different activities and things going on. Just lead us and help us to be in tune with your spirit to know what you've called us to. Thank you again for our brother Drew that he's here today and uh, pray that you give him a safe journey after church, but thank you that he could be here to lead us in worship this morning. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Let's sing one more chorus. Praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing Your praise, the oh Lord, the oh Lord our God. One more time. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore, for endless days. We will sing Your praise, oh Lord, oh Lord our God. You're dismissed.